John Huntsman is no stranger to Washington. He served as ambassador to China under the Obama administration until April 2011, when he resigned to run for the 2012 Republican nomination for president. Huntsman is a former popular two-term governor of Utah who once held a 90% approval rating in the state. Huntsman's held positions in the Reagan, Obama, and both Bush administrations and says he believes in serving his country regardless of party affiliation. Huntsman sat down with us to discuss the failure of his bid for the presidency and China in the coming years. You campaigned for president uh, in, for the, in the Republican primary. What an experience, right? Was it a good experience? It was a wonderful experience. Uh, you're reminded uh, just how many people out there in the early primary states actually take their citizenship seriously. Mm -hmm. They want good leadership. They want solutions to problems. They want a country that they feel is experiencing a lull uh, to get moving in the right direction. And, and that was a renewal of sorts in terms of how I saw our political system. Mm -hmm. Having done a thousand town hall meetings and interacted a lot with uh, the early primary voters, if you don't pander, you're in trouble. If you don't sign those silly pledges, you can find yourself in trouble. And uh, I would have uh, nothing to do with, uh, with either one of them. Would you trade it for anything? I, uh, no, I wouldn't trade it for anything because y you learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about the system, the process, and uh, heaven forbid if you're ever crazy enough to do it again, you've got a head start uh, uh, in the game. But. I'd have to say for me and also for my family, because I had uh, a wife and three girls, three daughters, who were very involved in the campaign process and who had their own outreach effort, the John 2012 girls. It was humorous. It was witty. They made good use of, uh, of uh, social uh, networking, social media, uh, to make it all happen. Mm -hmm. So not just for me, but a need for our entire family. It was, uh, it, was, it was an experience. Absolutely. So you suspended that campaign for the presidency on January 16th coming out of New Hampshire. Um, you put everything on New Hampshire. You bet the house on New Hampshire. Uh, I did. You spent all of your time there. Um, what happened? And why do you think that your message didn't resonate with the voters in New Hampshire uh, to the tune of first place? Was it just Mitt Romney's time? He'd been campaigning for six years? Uh, what do you think went on there? Well, we got in the campaign late. And uh, I think that means something. There's a certain aspect to the cycles, the timing of primaries. We got in late. We didn't have the head start that other people had. And I really do believe that on the organizing side, certain people held against me the fact that I'd worked for a Democrat, mm. that I'd crossed party lines. It's part of who I am. I mean, I believe in putting my country first. And I found that there were certain barriers that folks could not get over uh, about uh, my being in the race. And in such a bitter year, uh, a year that is full of extreme partisanship, there was a sense that Huntsman crossed party lines, and uh, that is unforgivable. Huntsman believes that working for President Obama, a Democrat, was among the greatest drags for his campaign. Getting in late, not raising enough money because you're in late, and it has to do with the rhythm of some of these early primaries, uh, the straw polls, if you will. I didn't do the Iowa straw poll, for mm -hmm. example, because that was an exercise in pandering and bringing, bussing in voters. You pay them by, here's how it's done. You pay them by the head. You give them a good dinner. You put Randy Travis in your tent and you ask for their vote. Who's going to turn you down at that point? And I say, I don't want to do that. That's not what I want to do. So if you don't play the early straw poll game, in Iowa or in Florida. Uh, you don't get the early boost, which means you don't often get the, the early funding. And so you have to struggle in states like New Hampshire, where it's all about grassroots work and it's all about your message. And uh, we were late and we were behind. I didn't want to pander. I didn't mm -hmm. want to sign pledges. I just wanted to talk about solutions. You talked a lot about the trust deficit uh, between the American people and uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, in an in a ABC interview uh, during the, uh, the campaign, you said, and I, I pulled this quote last night, I thought it was interesting, if you cross a party line, it's held against you. If you're not willing to throw red meat out there when they want red meat, it's held against you, and they'll go to someone that will. Uh, talk a little bit about that and the trust deficit, keeping that, that in mind, um, and what you were trying to, to get across that, that didn't uh, tend to work so well for you as did other candidates. Well, there, there, there is very much a trust deficit. So I like to say there are two key deficits that we face in this nation. One is economic, mm -hmm. and it's about debt, 
and it's something that your generation and all the students at this great university are going to have to work very hard on during their professional careers. Uh, and then we have a second deficit, and it's called the trust deficit. And we're to the point in time where the American people don't, have, don't trust their elected officials. They don't trust their institutions of power. They don't trust the banks that are too big to fail. They don't trust Congress. It can't seem to get anything done. So it creates this kind of malaise right now. Congress wants to get back in good graces. Uh, they want to show the American people they can do things, but they become divided because our systems become divided. It's red and it's blue. It's MSNBC. It's Fox. Mm -hmm. It's Republicans. It's Democrats. Name your favorite club, name your favorite network, name your favorite magazine, and it seems that it's all kind of taken sides, mm -hmm. as opposed to reminding us that we're all Americans first and foremost. And so I think many who are running for Congress in an attempt to get ahead, in an attempt to win, they have to pander to one side, their party side. Uh, and that causes them to lose sight of the larger vision, which we all should have as Americans, and that's what is right for we as Americans, uh, as opposed to what's right for the parties. So you went ahead and you endorsed Governor Romney uh, for, the, for the Republican nomination and ultimately for the presidency. Um, during the campaign, you'd criticized him for, uh, I think your words were, a lack of a core, as you like to say. You never know where he's really going to stand uh, on an issue. He criticized you in a number of the debates for being the ambassador to China under a Democrat, President Obama, mm -hmm. in crossing party lines. You turned around in an NBC debate and said, David, David Gregory, it is that, uh, that type of attitude that we see in Governor Romney that divides this country and endorses that, that division and creates it. Uh, and then you turn around and endorse him. Why? Well, of all the Republicans left, there weren't a whole lot. And I say, despite the disagreements, despite the distance between us on some issues, who's best prepared of all the Republicans left mm -hmm. to deal with what I think is the core issue, which is whittling down and dealing with our debt? Because it's like a cancer metastasizing in our country. Uh, if we don't get on top of it, if we don't start dealing with it, it's going to make this nation very sick. And I thought it's going to take somebody with the right kind of business background, even if they've been on two or three sides of every issue, it's going to take somebody who has a sense of the economic levers of power, uh, who's been a governor, who maybe understands how you get a state and therefore a nation back on its feet. So I thought of all the people left, who is best to do that? Who is best to get the country moving in that one direction? And that took me to Governor Romney. Huntsmith says China is in a transition phase, both economically and politically. It's grown at 9.5% for the past 30 years and cannot continue to do so. According to Huntsman, this will all result in a drop in foreign investment in China. And if China's GDP is going from 8, 9, 10 percent, 30 years running roughly, to more like 5, 6, 7 percent, that's going to cause a concomitant rise in unemployment. And any time unemployment gets high in China, historically, if you look at the trends and the cycles, it produces a larger itinerant roaming workforce, 100 million, 150 million strong, which put stresses and strains then on the big cities of the East Coast, Eastern Seaboard. And that creates uh, an environment for political instability. And I would have to say the years ahead for China probably don't look predictable mm -hmm. in the sense that there will be uh, a straight trajectory line of, of stability. I think they're going to have some ups and downs. And I think some of the ups and downs are going to be created by an uncertain economic performance. What does that mean? It means that investors are going to be looking for alternatives. You know, everyone's gone to China, costs are better. Uh, it seems to be the name of the game for a lot of people over the last 10 and 20 years. Uh, I think that dynamic is going to change. So what is the alternative in the international marketplace? It's not going to be Europe. Europe's flat. Uh, likely not to be Latin America. Amer the United States still remains 25 percent of the world's GDP. We have rule of law. We have good colleges and universities. We need to shore up our training and vocational skill acquisition uh, ability that we used to do a generation or two ago. We've got to fix our taxes. We've got to create a more transparent regulatory environment. A lot of things that we can do that I think can get us back on our feet from a manufacturing standpoint. But it's going to, it's going to need, require uh, a clarion call to the marketplace that the United States is willing to get back in the game of manufacturing and putting our people back to work. 
And then I think that fungible capital, that investment capital is going to say, China's looking a little wobbly in the years ahead. The United States is taking its future seriously. I want to be there. And I think we have every reason to believe that for your generation, we could see and mount a manufacturing comeback in this country. What do you think is going to be China's biggest issue domestically in the coming years? Is it going to be political or something of another nature? I think it's going to be holding on to single party rule in a day and age of a proliferating social media world, social networking, in a country with 600 million internet users and 90 million bloggers who are having conversations unprecedented in China's history about reform and about openness and about human rights and about the role of the internet in society. You can't stop that. And the party is saying, what do we do? If we don't make accommodations, if we don't make some changes and give a little bit in terms of liberalization, we can see a head-on collision by 2015. And that, I think, is the biggest challenge of all for China today. Upon being asked if he would serve as Secretary of State, Huntsman seemed to rule out that possibility. Well, I guess it's also a possibility that the Foo Fighters might invite me to be a keyboard player on their upcoming <laughs> That's right. tour. That's right. There are a lot of possibilities out there. I want to know about this uh, possibility. <laughs> I think it's highly unlikely. Yeah. Uh, I, I always believe in putting my country first and serving where you can get in and do something to help your nation in its direction, whether it's my term is my work as governor, twice elected, whether it's as a diplomat overseas a few times, you like to do what you can to help your country. If you're ever in a position to do something that's right for your country, I'm always going to give it some consideration. But I think anything near term is, is highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's okay because I'm enjoying reacquainting myself with private life. Well, good for you. And one of the guys speaks uh, fluent Mandarin Chinese, and he made it a point for me to ask you to say something. I don't know. Say that you enjoyed the experience or compliment me <laughs> or something. Say something in Mandarin Chinese for us. I just said I that uh, this interview that we've just had is among my very favorite <laughs> in recent memory. So thank you well, for it. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us and talking about all these issues. Great. Thank, thank you. you Pleasure to be with you.